cold winter morning in January of 1974, a killer stalked the Otero family of Wichita, Kansas. Little did they know that by the time school let out that day, the lives of four members of the Otero family would be brutally taken, and those of the three surviving children would become a never-ending nightmare. Dennis Rader, married father of two, an Air Force veteran, Park City employee, president of his church council, and Boy Scout leader. A seemingly normal man and pillar of his community terrorized Wichita, Kansas for over 30 years as the serial killer known as BTK, which stands for Bind Them, Torture Them, Kill Them. Come with me as we follow in the steps of Dennis Rader that fateful morning, and then those of investigating officers as they work to identify the monster that tore the young family apart. Justice eluded the surviving members of the Otero family for over three decades, but thanks to an arrogant mistake on the part of Dennis Rader and good old-fashioned police work, BTK was finally put where he belongs, behind bars for life. Welcome to Season 2. I'm your host, Elton Morgan, flying solo this season. This is the American Serial Killer Guidebook. Sometime between 7 and 7.30 the morning of January 15th, 1974, Dennis Rader approached the home of the Otero family. He snuck around back to cut the phone line, then stood before the back door, deciding whether to follow through with his plans and destroy the lives of seven people, or just go home. He didn't just go home. Of the five children, nine-year-old Joseph Jr., known as Joey, and 11-year-old Josephine were in elementary school, which began later than the middle school. 15-year-old Charlie, 14-year-old Danny, and 13-year-old Carmen Otero attended. This resulted in their being home when Dennis Rader made his murderous way into their home, forever changing the lives of the citizens of Wichita, Kansas. After watching the three older children leave for school, Dennis Rader approached the back door at which time nine-year-old Joey Otero was letting the dog out before he, his sister, and his parents headed to school. Before he could do so, Dennis Rader pulled out his pistol and forced the family back into the home, telling them he was wanted and on the run in search of food, money, and a car. He forced them into the living room, telling them to lie down before telling Joseph Otero to put the dog outside. Rather than leave his family, Mr. Otero had Joseph Jr. put the dog, named Lucky, in the backyard before returning to the living room. Dennis Rader then ordered the family to the bedroom and tied them up while Joseph Otero Sr. pleaded with him to take the car and what little money they had and leave his family alone. Realizing he hadn't worn a mask or disguise of any kind, and the Otero family could ID him, Dennis Rader made the final decision to take the lives of an innocent family. With Joseph Jr. tied up on the floor and Julie and Josephine tied up on the bed, Rader put a bag over the head of Joseph Otero Sr. and tied a cord around his neck, leaving him on the bed to suffocate. He then moved to Julie Otero and began strangling her, but while he was squeezing the life out of her, Joseph Otero Sr. began to jerk around wildly, eventually tearing a hole in his bag and gasping for air. Thinking Mrs. Otero dead, Rader quickly turned his attention to young Josephine, strangling her until he thought she was dead. Afterward, he put a t-shirt and bag over the head of nine-year-old Joey Jr., tying it off with a cord, at which time Mrs. Otero woke up. Begging for Rader to save her son, he actually went over and removed the bag from Joey's head to calm her down. It was then that he wrapped a cord around the neck of Mrs. Otero, and didn't stop until he was certain she was dead. Still caught up by what he calls his demon, he then moved over to Mr. Otero to finish the job by pulling Mr. Otero's belt tied around his neck, placing a t-shirt and a bag over his head. This ensured he wouldn't be able to breathe, making death a certainty. It's hard to imagine what was going through the mind of young Joseph Jr. once Raider took his bag off. Was Raider going to spare his life, or was he going to be brutally murdered like the rest of his family? That question would soon be answered as Dennis Raider picked him up, 
taking him to his bedroom, then placing a t-shirt and bag over his head and tying a cord around his neck. If things weren't enough of a nightmare, this innocent little boy had to endure this twice before finally succumbing to the depravity of the burgeoning serial killer soon to be known as BTK. At this time, Josephine, having seen her parents attacked and herself strangled into unconsciousness, woke up. Dennis Rader then took this innocent little girl to the basement, tied a rope around a sewer pipe collar, and hung her with her feet only a fraction of an inch above the floor. Rader then watched her struggle to breathe and die, all while being less than an inch from life. Once she was gone, Dennis Rader pulled her underwear around her ankles and masturbated, leaving semen on her and the surrounding floor. Raider then instituted what he calls the right hand rule, which is where he walks around the house room to room, all while keeping his right hand side facing the wall, cleaning up any evidence and gathering his killing implements. While preparing to leave, he stole Mr. Otero's watch, a small radio, and the keys to the family car, a 1966 Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser wagon, which he abandoned at the Dillon's grocery store located at 4801 East Central Avenue in Wichita, Kansas. A little after 3 p.m. that fateful day, 15-year-old Charlie Otero and his younger siblings, Danny and Carmen, came home from school to find the devil had visited their home. Charlie stated that he had noticed the dog was in the backyard, which was strange before entering the back door and seeing his mother's purse and contents spilled out across the top of the kitchen stove. He then yelled, Is anybody home? To which his little brother Danny replied, Charlie, come quick. Mom and Dad are playing a bad trick on us. That's when Charlie ran down the hall into his parents' bedroom and saw his mother tied up on the bed and his father on the floor with a belt wrapped around his neck. He knew instantly that his parents were dead, so he gathered his brother and sister and headed to the neighbor's house to call the police. Once police arrived, Charlie thought his youngest siblings, Joseph Jr. and Josephine, were still at school, and he begged police to locate them before they came home and saw what happened. But it wasn't until later at the police station that a chaplain and an officer told him that they were also victims. Within eight hours, a seemingly normal family who immigrated to the U.S. less than six months prior so that Mr. Otero could work building aircraft had their American dream shattered by a monster who took their lives for no other reason than to satisfy his six sexual fantasies. The following is taken directly from the police reports, identifying what police and detectives found when they entered the Otero home. Officers of the Wichita Police Department were dispatched to 803 North Edgemore at 3.40 p.m. on January 15, 1974. Officer Robert Beulah and Officer Jim Lindbergh arrived at 3.42 p.m. and were met by a distraught Charlie Otero, a 15-year-old boy. Charlie Otero ran to the officers and said his mother and father were in the house and they were all tied up. The officer instructed Charlie Otero, his brother, 14-year-old Danny Otero, and his sister, 13-year-old Carmen Otero, to remain outside. The officers entered the home. Entry to the home was made through the front door into the living room. The living room was neat and orderly, but the officers noted a brown leather lady's purse on the floor. The contents of the purse were strewn on the floor in the dining area. In the kitchen, the officers noticed a white box, possibly a girl's purse, and a black billfold on the stove. Contents of the billfold were on the stove. Officers checked the bedrooms. The door to the southwest bedroom stood halfway open. The officers pushed the door open and saw a man on the floor. A cut white rope and a butcher knife were on the floor next to the man. A woman was on the bed. The woman's legs were bent and hanging over the edge of the bed. The officers noticed blood on her nose and mouth. Officer Beulah found no pulse. The woman's hands appeared to be tied behind her back. A white cloth gag covered with blood was found next to her head. Officer Beulah notified dispatch that he had two possible homicide victims. Officer Lindbergh left the house to attend to the children. After Lieutenant Jack Watkins arrived at approximately 4 p.m., Officer Beulah left the house and notified the children that their parents were deceased. 
In an interview with Officer Lindbergh, the children said that they lived in the home with their parents and Josephine, a younger sister, and Joseph Jr., a younger brother. The children were distraught over having to tell Josephine and Joseph that their parents were dead. The children informed the officer that the family had lived in the home for only nine weeks. The children told Officer Lindbergh that the family car, a brown 1968 Vista Cruiser station wagon, was missing. Danny Otero told the officer that he and Carmen arrived home from school and found their parents in the bedroom. Joseph Sr. and Julie Otero had their hands tied behind their backs. Danny got a knife and cut the ropes. Danny's father was found face down, but Danny turned him over after cutting the rope around his father's hands. Danny tried desperately to perform artificial respiration. Charlie Otero told the officer that he arrived home and noticed the family dog in the backyard. Charlie said that the dog was never left in the backyard unless the family had company. While Officer Beulah was outside of the home, Lieutenant Jack Watkins discovered the body of Joseph Otero Jr. in another upstairs bedroom. Lieutenant Watkins and Officer Beulah searched the rest of the home. Josephine Otero was found in northwest storage area of the basement. Josephine Otero was hanging by a rope that had been tied to a sewer pipe. A white cloth was tied around her mouth. Josephine Otero was wearing a blue short sleeve knit sweater and it was naked from the waist down. Her panties were around her ankles. Josephine Otero was bound at the feet and knees. Lieutenant Watkins and Officer Beulah secured the home. While exiting, Officer Beulah noticed that the telephone in the kitchen was off the hook. In interviews with detectives, Charlie, Danny, and Carmen Otero said that their mother woke them up for school at 7.30 a.m. The kids were running late and left for school with their father at approximately 7.50 a.m. Charlie started to close the garage door, but his father said to leave it open because he was returning home after dropping the kids off at school. The children walked home from school because the family had only one car. Joseph Otero Sr. had been involved in an accident with the other car. Danny and Carmen arrived home from school and tried the back door. The dog was in the backyard. The children could not get the door open, so Danny went around to the front door. As Danny went to the front door, Carmen was able to open the back door. Carmen hollered for her brother, but she eventually went around to the front door. The children entered the home through the front door and noticed the mess in the floor and their father's wallet on the stove. The children went into the parents' bedroom and found their father on the floor and their mother on the bed. Danny went to his father as Carmen checked on her mother. The children attempted to revive their parents. Carmen removed the gag from her mother's mouth and cut the rope around her neck. Carmen used a pair of hand dykes, or toenail clippers, to cut the rope. The toenail clippers were found at the foot of the bed. Danny went to the kitchen to get a knife to cut the ropes from around his father's hands. Danny noticed that his father's chest was very stiff, and when he tried to revive him, Danny said the brown belt found in the bedroom had been pulled tight around his father's throat. Danny tried to use the telephone in the kitchen, but the line was dead. Danny threw the phone down and ran to the basement phone, but was unable to use the basement phone. Danny ran outside and contacted a neighbor. Charlie then arrived home from school. Charlie Otero said he closed the garage door when he arrived home from school. After entering his parents' bedroom, Charlie recalled pulling something from his father's neck. Charlie became very angry and began slamming things around. Charlie specifically remembered breaking a yardstick. Charlie Otero was informed of the murder of his younger sister and younger brother by Detective Ray Floyd. Charlie Otero became very upset. He asked police chaplain George Goody to tell Danny and Carmen about the murder of their siblings. Chaplain Goody was assisted by Father Gerald Reichek, a Catholic priest. After securing the residence, law enforcement set up a command post at an old school across the street from the Otero home. Chief of Police Lloyd Hannon assigned ten teams of detectives to investigate the murders and search for the missing car. Colonel Clyde Beavis assigned lab personnel to process the Otero home. At 5.46 p.m., Detective Lewis Brown located the Otero car in the parking lot of the Dillon's Grocery Store at Central and Oliver. The keys to the beige 1966 Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser were missing. 
Steve Christian, the brother of the former owner of the Otero home, reported seeing the car backing out of the driveway at approximately 10.30 a.m. Mr. Christian was on his way to pick up his mother and had turned west onto Murdoch from Edgemore when he saw the car backing out of the driveway. The car traveled west on Murdoch. At the Otero home, Officer Beulah assisted lab investigator Ron Eggleston in processing the home. Investigator Eggleston arrived at 4.10 p.m. A girl's and boy's coat were on the couch in the front room. A child's lunchbox stood open on the dining room table. An open loaf of bread, a knife, and several small tins of sandwich spread were on the table. Some slices of bread were covered with the sandwich spread. At the west end of the table, an open can of pears sat next to a small bowl of pears. A pair of men's shoes were under the chair at the west end of the table. The southwest chair was pushed away from the table, a leather purse was on the floor, and the contents of the purse were scattered. In the small kitchen, Investigator Eggleston documented a small plastic child's lunchbox and a billfold on the stove. The billfold belonged to Joseph Otero Sr. An open gallon of milk was on the drain board along with a handset of the wall-mounted telephone. In the southwest bedroom, Investigator Eggleston found Julie Otero lying on her back on the bed. Miss Otero was wearing blue jeans and a house coat. Miss Otero's feet, bound at the ankles, were hanging over the side of the bed. Miss Otero's hands were bound at the wrists with a white cotton rope. Miss Otero had bled from her nose and had bruised indentations around her neck. Portions of the white cotton rope were on the bed. Joseph Otero Sr. was lying on his back on the floor at the foot of the bed. Mrs. Otero's hands were not bound, but both wrists had rope impressions. Mr. Otero's neck exhibited similar rope impressions. A kitchen knife and pieces of white rope were on the floor. One piece of rope was tied to the north corner of the bed. Mr. Otero's right cheek was bruised and he appeared to have bled from the nose and mouth. Joseph Otero Jr. was in the east center bedroom. The bedroom contained bunk beds and a large packing crate. He was found lying on the floor next to the bed. Joseph Jr. was wearing a long sleeve button shirt, jeans, and socks. Joseph Jr. was bound at the ankles and the wrists with a white cotton rope. A blue t-shirt and a plastic bag covered his head. The bag was tied at the neck with a white cotton rope. Josephine Otero was in the basement utility room. Josephine was partially nude wearing a small knit top and socks. Josephine's bra was torn and her panties were around her bound ankles. Josephine was hanging by the neck from a rope that was tied to the collar of a sewer pipe. Josephine was gagged, but her tongue protruded slightly from her mouth and around the gag. Josephine was tied at the wrists and knees. The rope from her knees was brought up to her waist and tied between her navel and the pubic area. Josephine's toes were just a fraction of an inch above the floor. Investigator Eggleston documented spots or stains on the concrete floor directly in front of Josephine. Investigator Eggleston documented that severing of the telephone line at the rear exterior of the house and collected evidence from the scene. Evidence collected included specimen papers with samples of the stains at the feet of Josephine Otero. Dr. William Eckert performed autopsies on the bodies of Joseph Otero Sr., Julie Otero, Josephine Otero, and Joseph Otero Jr., the cause of death of Joseph Otero Sr. and his son, Joseph Otero Jr., was determined to be asphyxiation and strangulation. The cause of death of Julie Otero and her daughter, Josephine Otero, was determined to be strangulation. Joseph Otero Sr. was 38 years old. Julie Otero was 34 years old. Josephine Otero was 11 years old. And Joseph Otero Jr. was only 9 years old. These four murders were only the beginning of a terror that blanketed the city of Wichita, Kansas from 1974 until his arrest in 2005. Women and families locked their doors and were afraid to be alone for fear of becoming his next victims. 
Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss part two of our coverage of the BTK killer. I'm Elton Morgan, and this is season two of the American Serial Killer Guidebook. Thanks a lot, folks.